you, everybody. Uh, I'm Rick Wilson. I'm the director of Ciencia, and I'd like to thank you for attending today's Bachner Lecture. Uh, the Bachner Lecture is named uh, after Solomon Bachner, who was the Lovett Professor of Mathematics at Rice for many, many years and died in 1982. Uh, the Bachner Lecture Series occurs once each year, and this is a special part of Ciencia's lecture series. Well, this year's topic um, uh, this year's lectures are on the topic of creativity. And while people in various disciplines around Rice uh, differ in the questions we ask and the methods we use, I think what unites all of us uh, as faculty and students alike is the creative impulse we bring to our work. Um, this year, Ciencia is calling on people from both within and outside the university to talk about how um, their imagination works to tackle interesting questions and to pose novel ideas. And for today, we're just really fortunate to have Mark Turner speaking to us on the origins of creativity. Uh, Professor Turner does not dwell on small questions. Instead, he'll be addressing, why are we so creative? Where do not new ideas come from? Why are human beings so talented at innovation, leaving other species mentally in the dust? How can here and now brains Old new ideas that vault across mental networks of time, space, causation, and agency. Those are not small questions, okay? It'll be interesting to hear him address all of them. I'm gonna hold him to it. Uh, professor Turner received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he's an institute professor of, and professor of cognitive science at Case Western Reserve University. He's the founding director of the Cognitive Science Network and co-director of Red Hen Lab. If you do not know Red Hen Lab, you should take a look for it. It's easy to find. It's a collaboratory for big data and multi-mode uh, multi communication. Over the years, Professor Turner has earned many uh, honors, including an honorary doctorate from the Université de Haute Alsace, the Annalise uh, Mayer Research Prize from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and the Prix du Rayonnement de Langage de la Littérature Française almost did that right, from the French Academy. Uh, Professor Turner has uh, produced numerous uh, papers and books, uh, indicated indicative of his breadth is his 2001 Oxford University Press book, Cognitive Dimensions of Social Science, uh, the way we think about politics, economics, law, and science. And his 2014 book, many of you may be familiar with, uh, also from Oxford University Press, is on the origins of ideas, blending creativity and the human spark. So without further ado, Professor Turner. Thank you very much, Rick, for that uh, lovely introduction. Thank you for spending your afternoon with me. It's an honor to be here. Uh, <coughs> under the aegis of such a distinguished series, uh, and uh, with the wise owl of Athena in the background. I've uh, come to Rice many times in my career, uh, very, very fond uh, affections for it. Now, we have 40 minutes, as Rick said, to explain all of human creativity. Uh, so, there might be a few little things that we leave uh, over without being addressed. Uh, what I want to say is you don't need to take any notes. You just have to remember my name. This isn't vanity. If you remember my name, then you'll remember to go to markturner.org. And when you go to markturner.org, there'll be a zillion publications in all kinds of fields that you can download, and recordings of talks like this one, and links to Red Hen Lab, uh, and so on. Lots of answers to your questions, and uh, and so on. Uh, I'll be saying a word or two about conceptual blending, um, and from markturner.org, which people are looking at now. Thanks. Uh, if you click on the blending website, you'll go to the blending website at uh, uh, Stanford, and there you will see hundreds of books and papers and so on that have talked about this particular theory in the origin of mathematics, in scientific discovery, scientific understanding, linguistics and grammar, co-speech gesture, art, music, religion, representation, advanced social cognition, 
advanced tool use, and, and so on, right? Now, some of the things I'll be saying today are very straightforward and I think to be established. Uh, some of them are highly controversial, and there will be lots of people in science that uh, disagree with them. Uh, I always love criticism, and I like conversation, being the sport. Today, what I'll try to do for the first little while is give you a taste of um, this program, which is embryonic, and invite your cooperation. And then I'll try to leave a substantial part of the time for questions um, on the understanding that uh, this talk is, is just an introduction. Uh, we face a central uh, question that is, 50 years ago, more or less, during the Upper Paleolithic, um, the archaeological record begins to show uh, a history of human performance that's truly breathtaking. It might have been 60,000 years ago, 70, 80, 90, 95, 100,000. Depends on what we find in the border cave or the Bumos cave in South Africa. We are always subject to the archaeological record. I wish I had a time machine. I don't know why the SF doesn't give me one. I could solve so many scientific questions if I could just go back and look at what was actually happening, right? But <clears throat> I want to impress upon you how recent these phenomena are. Um, anatomically modern human beings are maybe 150,000 years old. That is, these are human beings that kind of have the body parts you all have, the skeletal, muscular, if you saw them, they sort of look like you. But the kinds of phenomena I'm talking about are only about 50,000 years old, maybe 60, maybe 70, maybe 75. It's not the absolute dating I care about, it's the shape of the wave. And when I say these phenomena, I mean art, music, science, religion, mathematics, music, advanced tool use, advanced social cognition. It's just a remarkable change. Almost everything that you care about comes up in the last 50,000 years. Law, universities, right? And on and on and on. But we're just talking about the top little tiny slice of time to somebody who looks at the big scope of things, right? Just, you're talking about the blink of an eye, 50,000 years. And that's almost nothing evolutionarily, right? I mean, if you look at how far vision goes back or these kinds of things, it's like, oh, billions of years. It's just, just astonishing. And life did not need us. Life was doing just fine 50,000 years ago. Uh, our ancestors were just a big mammal, not particularly promising mammal. And life had reproduction and metabolism, and it had all kinds of things. Right? It had creativity that came from evolution, biological creativity. And we know that's an awesome kind of creativity because, after all, there are us, there are other great apes, there are new and old world monkeys, there are moths, there are butterflies, there are all these other species, and these other species are really great. By the way, this is not a great chain of being story. I can't photosynthesize, I can't fly, I can't echolocate, and the genome of the Norwegian spruce tree is seven times larger than mine. But there are some things that human beings, and I give talks all the time about how awesome other animals are, a humpback whales, Tercia truncatus, New Zealand rooks, right? But human beings are off the chart compared to other species in certain kinds of things. And the question is, you know, how? What happened? Well, there's one way you might think about this, that there are traits, and so somehow human beings have a module to do music. That's important. You take a dog, it's raised in your house with all the music that is in your house, raised just like right in the same environment with the child, right? And you'll never find the dog tapping its foot with the beat. Uh, you can condition them to do it. If you're the master, you can kind of make them dance and so on. Now, the human infant, you can't stop from getting music like this. The dog, no. It's not that dogs aren't awesome. They're just as awesome as you can get. One way to think about this is that well, for everything that human beings can do, either kind of genetically 
implanted module that produces a capacity, a trait, and we just got a lot of them, right? Uh, I think that that's uh, the wrong view. Uh, so I'm giving you an overview here. I think that uh, there is a capacity that I call blending, but you can call it anything you like. It involves an awful lot of other sorts of things, analogy, metaphor, which I don't view as different sorts of things. I view them as blending happening under certain kinds of conditions. And that we uh, maybe going back as far as early mammals, early primates at least, have been on a climb in the development of the cognitive capacity to do blending. And yeah, and what happens here is as you go up this climb, this increase in blending, you get to a certain point where there's a small change in the causes that produces an enormous change in the effects. This is common in science. So you can jump, and you can jump farther, and you can jump farther, and you can jump farther maybe with some feathers, and then you can jump far. But there comes a moment where you've got just a little more lift, just a little, and then you can fly. A tiny change in the amount of lift you've got. And then your, your musculature can actually keep you airborne until you run out of energy. Similarly, you take a bathtub and fill it full of water. You add more water, and you not add a lot more water, and it won't pour out because the surface tension of the water We'll keep another few gallons in there, right? But then you add one more drop, breaks the surface tension, and three gallons of water flow. One drop, three gallons, right? Big deal. Lots and lots of cases in science where we see a small change in the causes produce a big change in the effects. And that is what I think happened. I think when we got up to the point of double scope lending, which I'll discuss in a second, when we got up to that, that made possible a range of supporting capacities. So this is like the Cub Scout pack. You know, the Cub Scout helps the pack go, and the pack helps the Cub Scout grow. So what you see actually is art, music, and social cognition, and advanced tool use, all these things sort of taking off at the same time because they actually support each other. I think they did that phylogenetically, and I think they do that ontogenetically in the individual child that is um, developing. Well, this is my view. Some of it's very straightforward and spade work. Some of it is, uh, I mean, some of it you can accept and use regardless of what your overarching theory is. And some of it's kind of contentious. And there are, I think, um, not quite so solid rival theories. And we can talk about those. So you can see uh, introductions to this in the way we think, written by Hugh Fournier, brilliant linguist. Uh, absolute uh, uh, pioneer, uh, and me in uh, 2002, Conceptual Blending in the Mind's Hidden Complexity, a more recent update that um, I published in 2004. So blending, also known as conceptual integration. Well, let me give you an idea of conceptual integration. Just an idea, a little taste. So my brother-in-law and his family are coming out to dinner at Thanksgiving dinner at my house in Cleveland, Ohio. And they live on the West Coast. He's a stockbroker in San Francisco. I'm going to pick him up at the airport. Now, I like math. I publish in economics, and I wonder if I'd like to be a stockbroker. He lives in San Francisco, and he's a stockbroker. And I think, oh no, if I were a stockbroker, I'd be miserable. Now, why? Well, there's one mental space that's got my brother-in-law and his wife. And he's a stockbroker, and he's in San Francisco. There's another mental space, which just means a little bundle of stuff I'm thinking about. And there I am, and I'm a professor, and I'm at Case Western Missouri University in the Eastern time zone. And I love my job, and he loves his job. We're both really happy. Okay? Now I realize that the stock market opens in the Eastern time zone at 9 30 in the morning. So if he's going to be competent in really risky things during the day, as a stockbroker, he has to get up about five o'clock in the morning. I am a night owl. Most of the, I, I do my research after everybody's asleep. If I see the dawn, it's because I stayed up and so on. So I would hate to get up at five o'clock. 
right? Now what's happened is I've made a blend of my brother-in-law and me. Now in the blend, there's a person who lives in San Francisco who is a stockbroker, but not my brother-in-law. Now it's me. Over here, there's a professor, but I don't bring a professor yet. Now this is really extremely complicated. You see it immediately in the blend. I am in San Francisco. I'm getting up at five o'clock in the morning and I'm miserable. Notice, by the way, so I don't want to be a stockbroker. And we do this all the time. We think about, should I this and that? And you make these planning blends where you put things together and then there's some development of a condition. You say, no, I don't want that. Or you see a development of a condition in the blend. You say, yeah, yeah, I really do want that. I'll make a plan to, to make that happen. Now notice, I should never confuse myself and my brother-in-law. I have to be very careful, although it's all in the backstage of cognition. It just happens for you just so quickly. You can't see it. Consciousness is a very thin read. Notice that in the blend, I'm not married to my sister. Right? That's taboo. Well, why not? The stockbroker's wife is one person, but his sister is another person, and she's unmarried. Why is it when I make that blend that my wife doesn't come down and inherit from over here sisterhood to the stockbroker? Doesn't happen. So we call this selective projection. <clears throat> Human double scope blending is taking two things you should not confuse. They often have extremely strong conflicts at the level of direction of causation, participant structure, intentional structure, you name it. But human beings are very good at blending them nonetheless. Double scope blending. Under a lot of constraints, which we discuss, and a lot of mechanisms, with some trial and error. And the real thing I have to impress here is emergent structure. So notice, in the mental space with the stock broker, broker, he's happy with his job. In the mental space with me, I'm happy with my job. Now, in the blend, there's somebody who's really miserable. Where did that come from? It is not cut and paste from the inputs. We do this all the time. We run the blend. Structure comes up in the blend. Now, you'll need a few examples to hold on to. Just want to point out how automatic this is. It's everywhere. The problem with a talk like this, an introductory talk, is the blends that I can show you are pyrotechnic. You can sort of see that they're blends because I need to show you that they're blends. But in fact, 99.9999999% of blends are completely invisible to consciousness. They don't strike you as blends, they just seem completely straightforward. But here's a case. Where, and now that you've seen this, you'll see this a million times, when somebody wants to indicate that a government is weak or having difficulty, they will take like a text that has a representation link to that thing, and they will blend the text with the thing. Now, a government or a state is a huge, huge thing. And here is the, an amazing thing. Human beings, unlike other species, who may have in instincts that lead them to things with long-range dependency, are able to think not only to think, to consider, to conceptualize, not only about the here and now, what they can see and what can affect them, but across vast ranges of time, space, causation, and agency. So think about Brexit. How much time and space and how much causation and how many agents are there involved in that. But aha, in the blend, this is a part breaking up from the whole. You get something at human scale in the blend that helps you reach up and hold on to things that stretch across causation, agency, time, and space. I used to say time, space, causation, and agency. But my students say, come on, Professor Turner, you're supposed to be an expert in compression. How are we supposed to remember that? So they invented a dis different acronym, but CATS, C-A-T-S, causation, agency, time, and space. And there you are, you have a little compression. This is what human beings are very good at. Well, the blend here gives you something that's at human scale. It's a thing in your vision that you can see, and it's falling apart. 
And what this means, of course, is that the government is falling apart. And up there it says in Spanish, these ruins that you see are the state. Okay? It's a fabulous, you shouldn't confuse the government with a rock. You shouldn't confuse corruption and scandal and instability at the large national political level with a crack in a rock. Right? That would be very bad. Um, you'd be insane. But notice you're not deluded. You keep all these, you can keep these spaces separate. We would talk, can talk, if you like, sometime about the kinds of psychopathology that arise when somebody does become deluded and lives in the blend in such a way that uh, they perform badly. There are other kinds of blends that you're supposed to live in. In other words, science comes up with a discovery, they make a new blend, and they reify this blend. They say, you know that old conception that we had? That's kind of wrong. It's really the blend that is the new one. So for relativity, quantum mechanics, for figuring out things in mathematics by limits, or Riemann sums, you get these new discoveries, but it's reified. And you say, aha, no, this blend is one that we actually want to embrace. Now, you will see patterns of these kinds of blends happen again and again and again and again. We give them names because they're canonical. They're extremely frequent. But I don't want you to think that there's a partition or a list of blending networks. And you say, well, is this, is this blend, is that a mirror network? Is that a single scope network? Is that a double scope network? Is that a simplex blend, right? Blending is an operation. And it can operate, as far as we know, over any kind of conceptual domain that you can consider. <clears throat> And there are principles of blending that we're in the science of study. And there are constraints on it that we're in the process of studying, many, many people worldwide. But the patterns that we pick out are patterns that are really, really common. It doesn't mean they're the only ones. And moreover, blending is not a diagram. It's an operation. It's not a product. It's a conceptual operation. So what we're talking about here is a conceptual operation that seems to be species-wide for all neurotypicals for as far as we know the last 50,000 years. And the question, of course, is how it got here. Um, and my proposal, of course, is that it is gradual. But that at a certain point, um, a small change in the causes produced an enormous change in the effects. And anthropologists like Terry Deacon have models of how such evolutionary change could state. Well, okay, as I wander around the world, you see the same pattern again and again and again. When they want to express that, um, hey, the Egyptian government is falling apart, they show you a symbol of it, and it is decomposing, just the way we saw before. Or something like this. And here, of course, all sorts of different government operators, agencies, and so on are underlying are, um, are, are, are producing instability in the government. And of course, the government has the face of the president who's going to be deposed, right? Now, when you see these patterns, you, you'll see a hundred of these in the next year, right? This is a case of a certain kind of blend. Now, again, Remember I said, the problem with this is that they're going to look pyrotechnic. But if you look at markturner.org and all the publications, it's going to emphasize the opposite end of the pole. Almost all blends are not extraordinary at all. You don't, they don't strike you as blends. You don't realize that you're doing, doing blending. Here is an example um, from a uh, six-year-old child at a dinner table. I was at a dinner party. And you know how kids like to talk about dog years? Well, in dog years, you'd be, right? Um, dog years is, of course, blend. It uses a nominal compound, dog and year. Now, we have dog years. It's like termite food. Nominal compounds constantly prompt for these kinds of blends. Sometimes uh, very, very interesting double scope blends, right? So dog years. And this kid had learned about chickens. And the kid says, if we were all chickens, you, Billy, who is a younger brother, would be about Elizabeth's age. Elizabeth is a caretaker, a college student at Stanford. 
You, Mary, would be about dad's age. And me, dad, and mom would all be dead of old age. We are lucky we are not chickens. Okay, now, what I want you to imagine is that there's a mental space and you're dying. And you know what? It doesn't occur to you that you're lucky. I mean, you don't look around and see that you're lucky. This is really, really important. There's lots and lots of stuff about your current situation that you don't realize. So I'm now going to tell you, everybody look around the room, get everything you possibly can. I'm now going to tell you something that none of you has noticed, and that is Beto O'Rourke is not here. But now that I have said it, the absence actually conditions, I mean, you understand that Barack Obama isn't here too. And they're, you know, it's the accountable infinity of these things. Right? You look around, and now the question is, What's conceptually here? And lucky wasn't there. But now you take the chickens. You should never confuse a human being with a chicken, right? Because you can't eat a human being, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. But you can make a blend, selective projection, into the blend, and now we're all chickens. And the part that comes down is something having to do with our longevity. Okay, so in the blend, we're dead. Three of us are dead. dead Dad, me, and mom, we're dead. So there's a distinction between the blend and the space that we're actually inhabiting. And now I realize, now I realize because of the blend, we're not dead and that we're lucky. So lucky, when you hit a word like lucky or unlucky or good thing or too bad or mistake or gap, there's a gap in the fence. There's a hole in the fence, there's a gap in my tooth, there's a dent in the car. But these are all calling up, asking you to make blends because the dent in the car, if I say, oh, this is a dent in the car, and it's just a shake, you might even thought it's a concavity. But over here, what I'm telling you by the word dent is I want you to imagine the car without this. It's a different thing. And now, in the blend, this is a dent, or this is an accident. No, that was an accident. This is a mistake. You have many, many single words that say to you, there's a blending network here. I'm not going to tell you how to fill it in. You have to fill it in. That I'm communicating to you to use that uh, bit. So back on, the, um, back on the blending, major cognitive scientific problem, is you can think about something. You can think about uh, something like, uh, um, here is a stockbroker who lives in San Francisco. You can think about something like, wow, here is a wedding, right? The amazing thing is while you're thinking about one thing, you can also call up something else. It's a major cognitive scientific problem. You can think about something that conflicts with your current environment. So there you are. You're at Rice University, and it's great. And you remember when you were in Norway the last time you were being recorded. I'm not in Norway. Why am I allowed evolutionarily to remember this? Call it to mind. Won't it confuse me? Won't it mess me up? Won't it distract me? Why is this a possibility? This is so important that Glenberg uh, is famous for writing an article saying that you would think that memory would be subordinated to the current um, situation so that you don't fall into delusions, so you don't have cognitive load, so you don't get confused. Sure, if you want to get out of the forest, maybe you remember how you got into it. But why is it that you can call up things that are radically incompatible with the current situation? Uh, so he explores that. It's not only that, it's that you can connect them. So remember, my brother-in-law and I are now connected. Not as identity. He's not the same as me, but as roles. We both have, we're both employed. And in another frame, we're both married and start blending those kinds of connections. And the result is a third space, or because you can blend over many more than two input spaces. Remember, blending is not a diagram, it's a process. Now you can create a space in which there are new ideas, emerging structures, which is a remarkable capacity of human beings. Now, when I usually, when I started uh, talking about blending, I did not talk about brother-in-law, and I did not talk about political cartoons, because people don't tend to take that kind of 
things seriously in logic, artificial intelligence, or science. So what I used is something called the riddle of the Buddhist monk. Here's a riddle. This is reason. Buddhist monk and the pre-dawn light standing for a while at the foot of a mountain path that leads to the summit decides to climb the path. He begins at dawn walking up the mountain, reaches the top at sunset, meditates at the top overnight until at dawn, he begins to walk back to the foot of the mountain, which he reaches at sunset. Make no assumptions about his starting or stopping, or about his pace during the tri trips. Only that he starts and goes and comes back, and he doesn't leave the path, right? Is there a place on the path which the month occupies at the same hour of the day on the two separate journeys? Now, you might have different opinions about this. I point out, uh, from evidence, this is very, very hard for people to wrap their minds around. I've had many mathematicians say no, or if you did, that would be coincidental. Or assume a constant speed, no. You don't have to assume a constant speed. It's a classic riddle. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. So here's a Buddhist monk, starts at the bottom, climbs up during the day, reaches the summit, at, eat, at dusk, sits down, meditates in the night, gets up, in that that dawn makes his way back down, gets to the bottom. Is there a spot on the path that the monk occupied on the two separate days this month that path? Now, stretch for just a minute. Notice that's not a month, that's not a path, and that wasn't a day. It wasn't even two days. But you all swallowed it. You all made the double scope play. I can say that month. Over here, you got the month of the journey and all these spaces. It takes a lot of time. It's an actual month. It moves at speed. Blah, blah, blah. Over here is this visual thing. You have no trouble making the blend and actually thinking that the blend would help you solve the problem. It's called a representation link. You make the blend. I show you a picture two by two. I say, this is my son. This is not my son. But there's a blend. And in the, you're not deluded. In the blend it is your son. But you can get interesting effects if you have a picture of your child behind glass that falls over and smashes. Ah! What's the problem? That's not your son. But you, you see these trace effects. Now, to make it easier for you, let's superimpose the monks. Suppose you take a video camera and you film the monks' ascent and you film the monk's descent, and then you show both of those on the screen by superimposing it. So at dawn, in the morning, the monk from the ascent is at the bottom, and the monk from the descent is at the top. And they do this, right? Like this. In fact, I wrote these in Flash, and all I did was pick up the Flash and dump it here. So they really are running at exactly the same time. The monk, the place is where the monk meets himself, and he has to meet himself, because you know when two people are crossing, on the path, or when two people traverse the path in opposite directions, they're going to meet. You have a frame for this, you have experience, emergent structure. Now, notice in the input spaces, there's only one monk, right? There's only one path, and there is no meeting. But I say the place is where the monk meets himself. That's grammatical only because of the blend. The himself, which is a reflexive, is grammatical for you only because in the blend there are two. You're not deluded. You don't, and there's lots that you don't bring in. You don't say, no, the monk would never meet himself because when he sees himself coming down the path, he's gonna freak out and leap off the mountain with you know, psychopathology, right? No, you don't bring that down. You're not even really sure that these monks recognize each other. There is selective projection, but it establishes the solution. Now you're going to say, hold on, uh, one example doesn't prove this for the general case. That's great, go to where, where are you gonna to go to find the answer? MarkTurner.org, that's right. Click on the Buddhist monk, it'll take you to a paper that has three mathematical proofs of this in three different styles. And you'll say, ah, so at last, Turner is showing us mathematics instead of some goofy flash cartoon. But of course, the three mathematical proofs are blends. They are blends of classic mathematical sort, 
and you will find the paper from James Alexander, the Knight Professor of Mathematics, called Blending in Mathematics, whose argument is the main reason mathematics has been so successful is that in teaching how to prove theorems, it enforces using certain kinds, searching for certain kinds of blending patterns. All right? So you can see those two. By the way, mathematicians often say, oh, I see, it's the fixed point theorem. It isn't, right? It's the intermediate value theorem, right? Okay, so what's happening here is, and again, there could be many more spaces and so on, we won't do that. You have input spaces, an ascent, a descent. Uh, you can make connections, you can have a generic space, which I won't talk about. Projection to the blend, and then you run the blend, then you get emergent structure in the blend, in this case, a meeting of the two monks. Now, I got a zillion other examples of this, but let's do something that is a mirror network. A mirror network is a case where you have different inputs, all of which have the same, the same kind of conceptual frame. It's very, very easy for people to make the connections because they all have the same conceptual frame. Here, the conceptual frame is running, running a mile or running a race. In this case, it's running a foot race. That's one mile. So the New York Times uh, wanted you to understand in 1999 that he kind of the had set the world record in a mile. They wanted you to understand what this meant. So what they did is take the fastest six milers of preceding decades and put them all where they would have been if they had run at a constant speed at, at the time when he got El Garouge past the finish line. So there's Roger Bannister. That's in the amount of time that he got El Garouge ran, that's how far Roger Bannister would have gotten. And now I can say things like Roger, Rod, um, he got El Garouge defeated Roger Bannister by 120 yards. Notice I don't hate new language. And Roger Bannister never met Hikam El Galush. This is a mythic race. Notice this is not a weird riddle, not a weird example. This is what the New York Times puts at the head of the factual article so that you will understand it very, very quickly. What's happening here is there are six that you understand immediately, almost no work, um, that there are six different input spaces. Every one of them is a mile race. And what's very interesting about it is you only bring down from each one the winner. And the winner is not only a winner, they're a world record setter in their input spaces. In the blend, Hikam El Garouche is the winner and all the rest are losers. This is like the person being miserable in the blend who has to get up and be the stockbroker. It's not a cut and paste from the inputs. We have five losers in this blend that are nowhere to be found as losers in the input spaces. And we can have uh, language for doing this. By the way, now that you see this, you will see all over sports presentation, uh, comparisons of record holders and swimming the mile or throwing the discus. People have no trouble seeing you. You press the button on the web, they run the little thing. And then the blending is really, really amazing because they use the race as a basic input. So when you see all the people throwing the discus, guess what? They all throw it at the same time. Nobody would ever have six people throw the discus at the same time in the same place because somebody would get hurt. But you use this as the template, you blend it, you blend it in. Um, in some cases, this kind of blending is just so straightforward that nobody, nobody even sees it. I won't go into the ways in which uh, you've been all using blending to understand my syntax and phonology and nominal compounds and how indispensable it is for learning language or any other kinds of things. Um, but I will say this. In the standard way of talking about the history of ideas, there almost isn't any other way. There's certainly no simpler way. What we run is a blend. And it's a blend very much like the mythic race, only it's a conversation blend. If you look at the great books of the Western world or whatever it is from Encyclopedia Britannica. The overview is called the Great Conversation. Across all these people who never met each other, mostly never met each other, and they're centuries, millennia apart, right? So imagine the philosophy professor who is trying to talk to his class about Kant. He says, 
I claim that reason is a self-developing capacity. Kant disagrees with me on this point, right? Because Kant thought there were certain things that just didn't work. You couldn't get rid of Now notice, in one space there's the modern philosopher who knows about the writings of Kant. In another place, there's Kant. Kant does not know this modern philosopher. You're not deluded. You don't actually think Kant disagrees with this modern philosophy. In the blend, you bring them both in together, and it's structured by a kind of debate frame. These guys are not in a debate, but in the blend, they are. You blend them with your debate frame, and now they're debating each other. Now, you can reify this. You could have had a goofy uh, TV show where you know Kant shows up in a powdered wig and a modern philosopher there is in Arachi sandals. And, you know, and they're actually going at each other and saying, hey, you, Emmanuel, I think you're stupid. And it would be a, it would be a variety show. Notice this is just the everyday way to talk about it. He says it's an eight, but I answer that that's begging the question. How can you answer Kant? Now, I can push it. I can push it, to which he counters. Now, notice in the blend, Kant is countering something that I just said, which is impossible in uh, Kant's own space of his writings. But you know what it means. You know that in the blend this is happening. It means there's certain relationships here. That I say this kind of thing, Kant said this kind of thing, and if I pick things out and position them in certain ways, then this thing is incompatible with this thing. And in the debate frame, I'm not deluded, but in the debate frame, I can say Kant is countering. Okay? I'm not deluded. But I say to that, what about Veronal group selection? And he gives no answer. Now, by the time I push this at the end really hard, you can see that, OK, he's, he's goofing on But I leave, this is my last example, and I'll take questions on any field you want to talk about. This is to begin to uh, leave you an example to remember that my claim is the 99.9999999% of advanced blending, double scope blending, the kind of things that give human beings the ability to make emergent structure, to come up with new ideas, is completely invisible to consciousness. You don't realize that you're doing blending. Blending takes no extra work. It takes no um, extra effort. This is what the Kylie modern human brain is designed to do. It's what it's doing all the time. And if you try to stop it, you can't. Thank you very much. Questions? So if there's questions, not I'll start. Why 50,000 years ago, or 80,000, we'll lump it up, when others may say it was 250,000? Um, yeah, that's just the right question, and I only wish I had a time machine. And we are all subject to the archaeological record. So if you dig up something, say, look, Neanderthals in this cave, in this cave 300,000 years ago, clearly had symbols on its stalactites or something, we look at it, we, we do what we can. I don't really care about the absolute dating, I care about the timeline. Now, there are, there are theoretical proposals about why that and other time, right? So the, um, Terry Deacon uh, makes the proposal that there was a certain self-domestication that happened. See, if you look at domesticated animals, they're highly various as compared with animals in the wild because they're protected from selection pressures. So for instance, if you look at domesticated finches, there are many species highly, if you look in the wild, there are many, many fewer because of selection pressures. Well, Deacon's idea is that Deacon's an uh, anthropologist, world famous anthropologist wrote the symbolic species is that you can get a self-domesticated species, and in some cases, it can be biological. So he points out that there's a kind of fish in Antarctica that essentially developed a kind of antifreeze in its blood. So it could go places that were colder than any other fish could go. But hey, guess what? There's a lot of food for fish in those places. So this thing boomed and boomed and boomed and boomed because it had extra protection. Right? And you've got large variations and so on. So Terry Deacon's sort of answer was, 
But there was time when human beings figured out how to clothe themselves and stay warm in cold environments, and they moved into cold environments. And it was just a vast amount of success to be had. You, there was food, there was you know, you, you, huge differential fitness increase. And then, of course, the selection pressures always come back on. So his idea was that um, there was a time when this, when the dangers of being uh, distracted by advanced blending, of wasting your time, of coming up with bad ideas, when you're just protected from the consequences because you're in pretty good uh, conditions anyway. And so it developed without being squashed. But by the time the selection pressures came back on, it was, it was so adaptive in the current generation to be able to have that kind of social cognition, that kind of tool use and so on, that it didn't get squashed. And the example we would give is something like this. These are just facts. We talk about 250,000 years. There was a tool set used in our ancestral line for 800,000 years called the Old Dolwyn tool set. Uh, be charitable, maybe not like 800,000 years, maybe 700, maybe 900, remember it's a long time ago. And by a tool set, I don't mean something you got from Sears that had ratchet wrenches. I mean it's a lock that's friable. You pick out the right lock and you strike it in a certain way. And you get some things you can use, like a scraping edge and so on. Just a couple of things, right? And it's very useful to have. Now, the Oldowan tool set stay without change, species wide, without change, for 800,000 years. Can everybody please say 800,000 years? 800, that was really pathetic. Can you do that again? 800,000 Yeah, I want you to think about 800,000 years. Can you imagine some little thing? staying unchanged, unimproved for 800,000 years. If you give this to a five-year-old now, the five-year-old is gonna do something new with it in 15 minutes. The real question, when you look at the archeological record, is how could this have happened? Now, there is a, 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 a hypothesis, I don't think it, it's very strong, that what you really need is, let's see, what's the best face I can put on this? It's a kind of cultural ratcheting effects. When somebody comes up with something, you need the rest of the culture to support it and say, oh, this is a good thing. We're going to keep it. We're not going to let it slide away. And there, are, I can give great examples of this even in historical times where something was invented. It was great. It wasn't picked up in, until a thousand years later or something like that. But you don't need much cultural support in order to maintain various kind of wonderful and useful products of double-scope blending. All you need is a parent and child. They can be isolated, working, working back and forth. So one argument would be, and I, 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 don't, I do not have a way to um, cancel this argument. I'm not highly disposed to it, but it's interesting that, in fact, the capacities had been there for much longer than the archaeological record shows. But the capacities kept trying to do things, and they fell apart. They just didn't get maintained by the population density. But then what happened at a certain point is there was enough population density to preserve uh, products in a very social notion. I think there's something to it. That would be an argument that says, yes, this blending story is right, but the conceptual run-up getting to the tipping point was earlier, but then the, the great effects just couldn't be saved for a while. They would have been for 50,000 years if you had more population density. But then you get the population density in both upper paleolithic, right? And that's, that is, I find that a quite intelligible and defensible argument. I don't myself think that it's likely to hold true, but it's, it's a good one. Yeah. Questions? So this is somewhat related. Uh, is there a way to quantify how much of blending is made and how much is um, going through a multiplier effect uh, to interaction with others and being surprised at blends that others have formed? Yeah, um, 
That's an absolutely excellent question because, of course, one of the things that um, we're particularly lucky at in blending is that we can imitate. So suppose you see the tree do something. It drops a limb and it breaks something. Now, I am not a tree and I don't drop a limb, but I can make a, a blend of me in the tree. And in the blend, I take the limb and smash the thing and I get the effect, right? This is really good. So imitation is all, at that level, is already dependent upon uh, various kinds of conceptual blending. There is imitation of other species. Perhaps if there's something to the mirror neuron craze, this helps us uh, imitate other conspecifics in performing certain actions and so to learn. Similarly from the cock monkeys, which is where mirror neurons were invented. So the interaction that we have is already, in my view, dependent upon veins blending. And I'll give you another example. Suppose you're not blending with a tree, but you're blending with another person. See, one of the things human beings are spectacularly good at is having a full concept of another mind. We learn more and more that chimpanzees, Pantrogonides, has more and more capacities for interacting with another man, contributing goals, that kind of thing. This is Michael Tomasello's work and the work of others. Very good work. More than we thought, but nothing like uh, a human being. Whereas a human being, you're looking at me, I look like you, I and but all you can see are forms. All that's happening is retinas are hitting your photons are hitting your retina and longitudinal waves are hitting your ear. You have no access to my mind, whatever. It's all indirect. But you make a blend of you and me. And when I do something, you think, well, if I were doing that, I would mean this or I would feel this or ah, ah, ah you would be in pain, that kind of thing. We're spectacularly good at that. So what I want to say is that advanced blending, it's, it's not that there's advanced blending that the individual does, and then there's this other capacity, which we call advanced social cognition, that helps it out. What I want to say is the double scope blending helps you invent the tool, and it also helps you invent that social cognition. So now we get this scaffolding so that the ability to blend and make other minds and the ability to blend and make new tools actually go together because now the other person can pick it up and it makes it possible for language. There are many, see blending is a little tiny thing. It's one extra thing sitting on top of all kinds of other sorts of things. Attention, memory, blah, blah. But once it hits, all of these things pop up and can help each other out. Now, we talk about genetic. It seems to me that there's no evidence that cognitively modern human beings, I don't know of anybody who thinks that there are differential capacities. Uh, there are individual difference, I'm not Mozart, I'm not you know, this, this, that, and the other. But the basic mental operation of advanced conceptual blending seems to be available to everybody. So is advanced blending genetic? Sure it is, I can't see how you can have every cognitively modern human being capable of this rocking advanced mental operation and not have it be in some ways a result of the production of brains and bodies that can do this. Is it individual? Sure, you can do an awful lot of blending, talking to yourself, working on things, doing mathematics. Is it social? Yes, it is, because there is the ratchet effect. But it's not that, hey, it's the ratchet effect that saves blending so that it can survive. The ratchet effect in social cognition is actually, uh, it's not caused by blending, but you can't have it at the level you have without uh, conceptual blending. So I would say my answer to quantify is that this isn't really a, um, these aren't three, three terms in an equation that we add up or three factors that we multiply. But on the contrary, the Cub Scout makes the pack, helps the pack grow, go, and the pack helps the Cub Scout grow. So I would tend to look at these, at, at the genetic part, the individual part, the social part, the linguistic part, the representational part, the memory part, as conspiring, as all being used in order to produce this kind of uh, result. As I say, I wish I had a time machine. I will say that on quantification, so I teach introduction to cognitive neuroscience. I sometimes design brain imaging experiments. 
eye tracking, fMRI, PMS, ERP, that as far as we know, people are doing blending all the time. So if I were to say, I'm doing some brain imaging, when would I see blending? The answer is all the time. And they're doing it in every domain that a human being can operate in. So where would I see it operate in the, in the brain? And the answer is everywhere. So if something's happening all the time everywhere, you're not going to be able to pick out something that's distinguishing, right? It's also a kind of uh, hypertrophy. I think lots of animals, dogs, chimpanzees, you know, can manipulate mental spaces and make connections between them. Once you can do that, then you can get blending and advanced uh, blending, right? So this is an this is an operation that exploits all kinds of things that are already there and already running. So I uh, hate to say it, but I don't know of a brain imaging technique that could distinguish uh, this pattern as blending and this pattern as that. But I do have one idea, and I proposed it to a team in Germany, and they're working on designing experiments now, and that is, suppose you have an eye tracking machine, and you have people watch something. And then they watch something else. Now, if they're blending those two things, then they would expect a certain kind of event in the blend, which means they should look for it, right? So what we're trying to do is to have controlled experiments where you see something, you know, there's a control, but then there's a treatment. And in the treatment, we say that, um, and we, then we, we ask them to solve a riddle. So we could see whether or not they actually got the answer. And the answer would have to be something we have because we're blending these two things. And just see where they look. So this is very, very simple, very elementary. But we are trying to see whether or not we can get uh, behavioral experiment, imaging experiment, uh, evidence for whether or not somebody was actually doing the blending. Uh, another one is, in the, in like the Buddhist monk. Uh, we post the riddle, we did, we did an experiment with this, it was just a pilot, but it's pretty good, and it's published. We, uh, the guy in uh, Serbia did this, a team in Serbia. They posed the riddle on the computer. Now, in one case, they have a, just a, a computer background, just a background, and something's moving. It's about the same size, about the same color, about the same thing. In the other one, they have two things that move across, just dots. But it, it's it's very, it's not emphasized, it's just a very background sort of thing. The question is, if people are primed to think of an intersection, are they better at solving this riddle? And the pilot is, yeah, they actually are. Um, so if anybody has any behavioral or imaging experiments, uh, to help us investigate this on living with people, delighted to hear it. I would say the biggest effort for trying to figure out which parts of this are doing what is computation. So there are many computer teams around the world. Coinvent is a big one. They have $5 million from the European Union. You can find them at markturner.org, and they just published a book, um, which is an attempt to make computational models and blend them with application to a number of different environments, uh, especially music and math. Everybody loves music and math because you can kind of quantify them as vectors, so you can use machine learning and symbolic programming and linear algebra to manipulate them and so on. Uh, because if you could get a computational system to model this, as has been discovered by many military and governmental agencies, if you could get a computational model to pick up a little of this, then the, the system in the field that's autonomous and is not being driven by remote control might have more flexibility in actually problem, solving the problem in the field. But I really don't want to overstate this the sort of science of from all sides of how you would investigate this is embryonic. And I'm always eager to hear from anybody who wants to put it, push it forward a little bit. There's one thing that the that the ecologists will tell us, and that is, in that evolution is tremendously active whenever there's an environmental pressure that wipes out three fourths of the population. And you know the asteroids did that 
uh, to the dinosaurs. But there was a very important event that happened 66,000 years ago, uh, and that was the Lake Toba event. And when the hominids in East Africa were basically all wiped out by this ash from a super volcano coming over from Indonesia. And I think, to my mind, and we put it forward in our, our work, uh, Lucy's Cradle, uh, we proposed that that was really why, how the humans got their intelligence is because they had to band together or they would die out. And they, they went from an arboreal situation where everybody could pick their own fruit uh, to being where they had to band together in order to survive. And, and to my mind, you know, they, they've seen that in the mitochondrial DNA, that the humanity went down to less than 2,000 right. individuals. So I'm not surprised that that time right. is right. when the brain really changed because it had to. Yeah, um, so now I have a face to put with the name. And, and Lucy's Cradle is, by the way, an awesome uh, blend and a great title because, of course, there were no cradles. But you're making a compression. And it's not the whole species, it's just Lucy. But it, you got it in the blood, and now you understand it. And did you understand that the researchers are not saying, oh, yeah, there, it was all important because there was this one person, Lucy, 13 years old or something like that. She's in Cleveland, by the way. The, the uh, Cleveland Museum of Natural History is the one that sponsored the Leakies and had a lot of work done there. And that she was actually in the cradle and protected, and that's why this all worked. You're not deluded. It's a great blend that gives people a compression for trying to understand it. Now, I think that's a great kind of reasoning. You're quite right. I, 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 I uh, understand about the mitochondrial DNA. You know, mitochondrial DNA is uh, the one that, carry, that carries the female uh, uh, information. Uh, so you can do lots of things. You're quite right that human beings face, as far as we can reconstruct, terrible challenges at, uh, at certain points. And Face, you know, had real, real, real pressures. So I really like this. I'm not equipped to do the paleo uh, anthropology on it. I'm a consumer of such stories. And sounds plausible. I love it. It rocks. I try to work on human beings who are alive because you can actually see what's going on. But the problem, the, the only problem with this, and I love it, I have stories about the origin of language, a lot of origin stories, is. Uh, is this. We have no direct access to anybody's mind. And my, my conception of pseudoscience about human beings is using one method and saying, well, my method is the right one because they are all quite weak. I look for many indirect methods sort of all pointing in the same direction, and then I start to feel more secure. The, this is a kind of explanation. Very powerful, very plausible. I like it. The weakness of all such uh, 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 claims is if they they are reconstructed just so stories that if this was working then it could have been and lots of the if this is a case where lots of times we get the blend we get the just so story it would have been if we could have and we and then we say no no the, the anthropology and archaeology support us we actually think that's right we don't think that that's just a just so story we have other kinds of evidence for it and um, anthropologists and paleoanthropologists. Uh, and archaeologists frequently come up with this this kind of story. The 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 other kind of story is no 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 they, you had it all the time you just didn't have population density. Or there's another kind of story that is lightning came down and hit somebody and you have a hopeful monster and suddenly somebody was a genius. That won't work really I think for blending because you, you know boom you have a lightning strike and somebody then has grammar. Problem with that is none of the conspecifics have grammar, so it doesn't do you any good. Right? You need a kind of, you need a, in my view, an evolutionary story where if there is an advance, the others are equipped to understand it, right? But thank you very much for that uh, that citation, and I'll I will go home and reread Lucy's Cradle. I'd like to thank everybody for attending uh, this lecture, and especially would like to thank Mark for giving it. Thank you very much. Thank you.